uh, we could tell a lot of stories, uh, but uh, uh, David Satcher, who, we, uh, who, who has been here, really was a leader in bringing uh, mental health issues to the attention of the country, both with that report and, and with follow-ups on children. A really interesting time, but um, we're not here to dwell on the past, so what I'm going to do uh, is uh, uh, spend the first part of this session asking questions of my fellow panelists and inviting discussion among them. And then for the last 20 or 25 minutes, we'll have uh, questions from you. Uh, let me just quickly introduce this very distinguished panel. Uh, to my right is Elizabeth Dykins, who's the Annette Schaefer Eskin Chair and Director of the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center, co-director of the Kennedy Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, professor of psychology and human development psychiatry and pediatrics. So you have to go to a lot of department I meetings. Do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, to my uh, left is uh, Tom Insel, who is uh, a uh, notice really important scientist in the area of social cognition. Uh, but for the last 12 years, uh, 11. 11. But who's counting? Who's, yeah, well, uh, has uh, uh, been uh, uh, the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. And, and a real scientific leader. Uh, to his left is uh, Leisha Ostrow, uh, who is a doctoral candidate at the uh, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, she is co-director of the Lived Experience Research Network uh, and is interested in services and policy relevant research as well as the role of consumers in research. Uh, and then, uh, to my far left is uh, Nora Volko, who is uh, also a very significant science in the, scientist who has worked uh, as a pioneer in neuroimaging, uh, above all, of reward circuits that contribute to substance use and addictive disorders and many other things, which may come out during the discussion. And she is now the long-serving uh, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So let me just begin, uh, I, I was asked uh, to, to just frame the issues, um, and, and, and I want to do it very briefly, and I want to begin it by presenting a very strange paradox that we find ourselves in. Uh, those of you who heard Vice President Biden last night uh, heard uh, both uh, uh, the, the, the clear and true statement that we have an enormous amount to learn about the human brain, but one could add about uh, the relationship of brain and behavior and environment and context. And uh, the, the current administration is also uh, very dedicated to pushing brain research forward. In fact, this is a remarkable era for research on brain and circuits and, and, and behavior, both uh, normal, healthy variations, but also uh, uh, thought and behavior that uh, creates uh, disability and distress. Um, but the science has, after long periods of frustration, dealing with what is the most complex object of scientific investigation that human science has ever faced. Uh, I apologize to any theoretical physicists in the room who might be heard about that, but I think the uh, the brain is really remarkably difficult. And what's happened uh, uh, really uh, in a way that uh, almost defies anything we could have hoped for in the last decade is a convergence of new technologies to help us understand the brain. Now, we scientists like to think we're very smart and we like our ideas, but uh, tools really matter. I always remind people of Galileo, who was uh, you know, the greatest um, uh, both astronomer and, and physicist and theoretician of his era. But what really mattered to Galileo was um, uh, just incremental advances in optics that allowed him to build a telescope. I mean, he built his own telescopes. And the, only then he could make the observations of the moons of Jupiter, and he could uh, change our conception or, or prove the Copernican conception of our solar system. No mean feat. But he needed to be able to make the observations. So what's happened for us in the last decade are, among many other things, uh, uh, extraordinary advances not only in human imaging, which perhaps you've heard about, 
but also uh, in, in animal models, the ability to understand what brain circuits are doing uh, by genetically engineering in um, uh, molecules that respond to, uh, to, to certain wavelengths of light that can uh, cause an animal to behave one way or another, but it's allowed us to interrogate uh, brain circuits, and I won't give you a long list, but uh, but uh, but this enormous excitement about these large-scale circuits in the brain, because that's what's closest to thinking, to emotion, to behavior. And when we talk about uh, mental illness and the brain, uh, we have to understand this the one level down. There's a long distance from molecules to to, to thought and behavior. But at the same time, uh, the, the Genome Project uh, has benefited us enormously. Uh, the cost of sequencing DNA has declined by a million fold in the last decade. So it makes Moore's law of computer chips look pretty uh, torpid. Uh, and, um, you know, a lot of our illnesses run in families. And so the ability to analyze uh, DNA and, and genes which doesn't turn us into genetic determinists, just gives us important molecular clues as to what's going on in mental illness, has opened a whole new uh, vista for us. And it's not just a promissory note. It's actually happening. There are now 110 places in the genome that are known with certainty to be associated with risk of schizophrenia. So we're beginning to assemble a parts list. Now, we, we've got to do a lot more than that, and that's going to be hard. And then one other thing I'll mention, uh, you know, um, uh, I always say that cancer is a easier hard problem. We have a hard, hard problem. And I say that because uh, cancer biologists uh, can go to a surgeon and the surgeon will hand them the disease that they have resected or biopsied. And so the very cells that are the disease are available to the researcher. We can't do that. I can't sidle up to somebody and ask for a little piece of brain. <laughs> and, you know, even if I could, it wouldn't help me because it, it goes back to the circuits. It's not uh, our, the, our thoughts, our emotions, and our symptoms are, are not due to a single chunk, right? The, old, the phrenologists were not right. They're due to uh, distributed circuits interacting with the environment. And so we need to be able to... Uh, if we're going to make use of the genes we're discovering, we need systems to uh, interrogate them. Um, and uh, lo and behold, at the very same time, we've developed the ability through stem cell technologies to turn skin cells from healthy people, from patients, into neurons in, in, a, in a dish uh, and begin to make little circuits. Now, none of us are so daft as to think that what we're doing in a dish is a perfect model of a brain, so far from it. But, but finally, we can have work on living human nerve cells. So this is remarkable. So that's all the good news, and it's really exciting. So, but the, I, sa I started by saying it's a time of paradox. Well, the paradox is just as our science is beginning, and it is early stage, but really beginning to be so exciting, we're beginning to attract into this area some of the brightest uh, uh, young scientists that, uh, around. Um, industry has called it a day, and they are leaving our field. And, you know, so, uh, you, all of us at different times have been unhappy with the pharmaceutical marketing arms uh, who have often made, you know, egregious and smarmy claims. Uh, but we need their scientists to succeed because they're the people who make medicines. And uh, what, what's happened is that uh, uh, the medicines that we have, we wouldn't be without them. They're, they're really terrific. But... There's been no really fundamental change for 60 years, which, which is unlike any other area of medicine. Uh, so one new antidepressant after another had slightly fewer side effects or this or that, but fundamentally no greater efficacy for patients than the very first drugs discovered in the late 1950s. And ultimately what happened is that payers um, in Europe, not in the US, payers in Europe basically said, you know what, We're, forget it, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you can show greater efficacy, uh, in fact, we're not even going to let our regulators approve a new drug. And a lot of companies, unfortunately, uh, who had been making lots of money in this area, said, well, oh, more efficacy. Well, we don't know how to do that. And uh, large companies have really exited. So 
So the science is burgeoning, but we have to translate it. We have to turn it into medicines. So we have our work cut out for us at a policy level and a scientific <laughs> level. And then the other thing I think um, which um, the, uh, the Tom and Nora can't talk about as readily as I can because I'm no longer in the government is, you know, uh, if you read any paper, you know that uh, there's enormous budgetary pressure. You know that uh, come January there may be a new round of cuts. And uh, almost any congressperson you talk to um, w will stipulate that research is really important. You know, they want illnesses cured, but the budgetary fights take precedence. And so uh, I've said uh, that this science is so wonderful, we're attracting to these really important problems of turning science into treatments ultimately, incredibly bright people, but how are they going to make careers? Um, and, and, and so that's, that's the other dark side of this very strange time for us. So with that, uh, just setting the stage, great opportunity, but a lot of work to be done and some challenges. Um, let me, uh, let, let me uh, first turn to, um, to Tom and, and just ask, um, as a general question, you know, what are you seeing from your vantage, and then we can ask Nora, what are you seeing from your vantage as an NIH Institute director about the quality of, you know, the better scientific applications that you're getting for grants, the kinds of people who are applying, um, and, uh, you know, um, what's your level of optimism for scientific advance and, above all, for turning science into treatments that are going to matter? And then we can ask some of the we can ask about developmental disability, and we can ask some of the policy questions. Well, good. Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, and I would concur with uh, almost everything you've said. The, I, I think for the view from NIH is largely that in so many ways this is the best of times and the worst yeah, of times. Yeah, exactly. Best I, have, of I times. avoided Dickens, but there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we could, there's some yeah. other Dickens quotes yeah, we yeah, may yeah, want to yeah, get into, yeah, yeah. but for this one, yeah. I, um, I think the scientific opportunity, as you said, uh, is unprecedented, and a lot of that has to do with the tools. Yep. And uh, as you implied, you know, there's a, a wonderful theoretical physicist here at Harvard, Freeman Dyson, yeah. who's, who's famous for saying that the great advances in science depend actually much more on, uh, on new tools than new concepts, and that often new concepts come about because you have the new tools. We are right at that stage, and if you look at the last decade, it has been the decade of discovery science. It's a decade ago, you know, 98% of the literature was focused on essentially three neurochemicals, yep. uh, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. Uh, and today, we know that there are 30,000 that we need right. to be thinking about and that there's, you know, it's a much broader picture. In a sense, it's kind of like, you know, we were so much uh, older than we're younger than that now. We, we know <laughs> much less and we're much more aware of uh, how big the universe is that we need to uh, deal with. And I think scientifically we have moved in so many ways from thinking about the brain as soup in which depression means you're a quart low in serotonin and schizophrenia means you got a little too much dopamine on board to now understanding this is about circuits and it's about complexity and it's about trying to understand multi-level from basically from neurons to neighborhoods and that all of this matters and that we have to do the science that integrates that complexity. So scientifically, we're at a very different place with a tremendous sense of opportunity. And to me, the, the most uh, hopeful sign of that is when I look at not only the applicants we get, and, uh, the applications we get, but the applicants yeah. themselves. Yeah. That you know, when I came uh, in 2002, there were, I believe that year, um, 15 MD, PhDs going into training in psychiatry. And some of those had had their PhDs in fields far away from neuroscience. So it uh, was a handful. Uh, that number was 46 this past year. And um, they are, cons and that's actually not true for other areas of medicine where it's gone down, not up. So people who in the past, and I have to confess, even from my own laboratory, were choosing to go into neurology or immunology or oncology because they thought that's where the action was mm -hmm. in 2002 are now focusing on autism, schizophrenia, 
neurodevelopment. There's just, you know, this is the hot place to go. They come out of college with a neuroscience interest. They go to medical school, get a PhD in neuroscience, and then they get engaged. So this is great. Terrific workforce that's coming in. Uh, the question is, how do we support them? The NIH has lost uh, about 25% of its purchasing power in the last decade because of flat budgets, decreasing budgets this past year, and not keeping up with inflation. So uh, we are not where we were when you left. Uh, yeah, at sure. the time you left, I think we were paying about one in four grants. Uh, even, even more. The okay. one year we got to 30%. Yeah, so yeah. we are, uh, we yeah. have, <laughs> we're not even at one in five yeah. at yeah. this yeah. point. So, yeah. uh, and, and that means that there's some really great ideas and a lot of very innovative ideas that do not get supported. I think the question that will be interesting for us to talk about is in the same way that the first session was sort of focusing on this, how much of this gets supported by the federal government, how much mm -hmm. by the states, who sets the policies, where does the funding come from? Here we're actually grappling with this interesting question that if the federal government is no longer going to make the big investments in R&D for brain disorders, where, where is, is that going to yeah. come from? Yeah. Uh, our, one possibility is we say, let's let the Chinese do that, and they will, and we'll just learn from them and try to import what they come up with. The other possibility is that there'll be private foundations, and we've seen this for autism, yeah. um, in the same way that we had previously seen it for type 1 diabetes and for breast cancer and many other areas. <coughs> Happening for Parkinson's, a wonderful a column yesterday by Joe Nacera in the New York Times about the possibility that private foundations can now not just advocate for changes in policy and advocate for better services, but private foundations can actually have a very active role in moving the science forward and making discoveries creating registries, developing clinical trials, can they, they can really change the picture of how we do diagnostics and therapeutics. And that's a question on the table. Is that yeah. what we have to look to because it's not going to be supported in the same way, um, at least unless there's a change yeah. um, in, by the yeah. federal government. That's good. So let me ask Nora, what are, you, what are you seeing, And again, in terms of the research possibilities, the workforce, and the translatability into treatments? Well, I, I resonate a lot of, with what Tom has said, and I think uh, with what you say, and, I, and, and there are words that, that just come to my brain, integration, complexity, and I think that we are faced with probably the most complex uh, problem that uh, we've, we've encountered as humans. And there's something in all of these advances that you mentioned, there's another one that I think is fundamental in our ability to succeed, and that's the changing culture for an open access policy. Yeah. And I think that when you link it with what the web can do is an extraordinary tool mm -hmm. because it allows us to integrate, but it also allows us to exploit complexity. Because, I mean, what we are faced with, I mean, we build complexity out of simple models, and it's their integration into networks that ultimately generates a complex system. But no one of us, in, within the limits and constraints of our brain or our discipline, can comprehend that completely and, and thereupon the importance of this open access. Having access to open access generates data banks that are very large and of course the type of questions that you can ask when you are addressing a complex system require that type of databases. So I think that that is an extraordinary uh, tool that we have. It does require a new type of scientist and I think that that's one of the areas that I, I view as a, as a challenge. Sure those scientists that do have the background in modeling mathematics because it's also the tools that we've used in the past like s classical statistics are inadequate to address what we have in front so that requires a science in itself and being able to attract the type of scientists into the endeavor of neuroscience is a crucial one and not just attract them but actually uh, also train them so that they have the basic knowledge and, and that has been... So what you're saying is no more going into biology because you don't like math. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I think right. that that is where we are yeah. right now. Yeah. Because, because when you say, what is the type of applications that we're seeing more and more, and this is across all of the NIH, is more comprehensive. So these these uh, 
projects that involve the integration of different areas of science coming together to address um, a whole system as opposed to these isolated uh, entities, which for understanding the brain is fundamental. As you say, I mean, if we speak about the frontal cortex, it's gigantic territory, but, but in isolation, it doesn't really even approach to understanding mental illness. So we have to generate those, those systems. What are, I mean, certainly challenges that our budgets are being caught. I do believe at the same time, though, that the science is so extraordinary and it's advancing so rapidly that uh, the opportunity of generating products that can make profit is something that very clearly was illustrated by the human genome. Yeah. That whole area of investment of research on genetics has generated a massive amount of investment uh, in, in, in industry that in the past would have not gone there. So I'm confident that as we gain knowledge of how the brain works, that in turn is going to turn into products that will result in a very different type of investment that we have apart from, from that one of foundations. I, I, so, so I am, in that respect, uh, very optimistic because I think that what we're seeing in science is just extraordinary. And as we learn, it's like uh, there is a movement. Th th there's almost like an inertia that knowledge pushes itself. And, and so we're going to get surprised in, in ways that we haven't done. For the therapeutics, as you know, we, NIDA has really never had very much investment from pharmaceuticals. So it makes it harder now because we cannot take advantage of compounds that could be targeted towards mental illness. So, but on the other hand, I think that pharma is also waiting for a breakthrough. And in the, the areas of science, one that I think is, is in the future will be very relevant is that whole area of epigenetics. Yeah. The ability to modify gene expression, I think is going to really uh, revolutionize the way that we do, do treatments as we understand it, of course, better. So let me, let me be, uh, just because our time is so short, um, let, let me think, I just want to pick up on one point because I think it's very important in this audience. You talk about open access, but part of it implicit is the willingness of scientists to share data, uh, <laughs> to have big enough data sets. And um, short of tinkering with human nature, um, this is a this is a challenging uh, revolution. I remember when I was NIMH director, I, uh, I I occasionally said things I shouldn't. I described some group of investigators as having the Pharaoh model. They wanted to be buried with their data, uh, <laughs> lest anyone else use it. But I think I, I think um, again, the younger generation uh, seems to be much much more open to this. It's very important. But what I was going to say is. In, in many ways, it was um, consumer groups who were pushing. They said, you want us to advocate for you, but we advocate for you insofar as you want to solve the problem. We understand incentives, but the primary goal is not for you to be famous and to lord it over your data set. The yeah. primary purpose is to solve the problem. And that really, in some ways, began with the autism community. Yes, and, and, it, yeah. and it continues. Yeah. Let me turn around, because often developmental disability has been well, it's a, often a different institute, child mm -hmm. health, and um, you know we build these uh, bureaucratic silos. Yes, indeed. But uh, <laughs> in reality, there's a lot of uh, shared symptomatology, a lot of shared risk genes, all, all kinds of things mm -hmm. between what is classically called mental illness and de developmental disability. So maybe you, you just want to have the opportunity to talk about how Absolutely. these research areas uh, touch each other. I think many of us are accustomed to thinking of people with intellectual disabilities as separate from people that have mental illness. Um, but 40% of the time, 40% of the population of people with intellectual disabilities actually have significant behavioral and emotional dysfunction and full-blown mental illness. Um, you know, the, the tragedy is that oftentimes uh, those individuals present with very unusual symptoms that the average practitioner doesn't quite know how to evaluate or handle. And as a result, this population is prone to being over-medicated or they have polypharmacy. It's not atypical for us at our center um, where we see some of these individuals uh, to have them come in with a box of medications and binders this thick. 
um, to be on multiple, multiple medications in the same class. Um, and that's often a result of going from one practitioner and getting one set of meds, then going to another, to another. And there's very little integration across those systems of care. So as a result, it's hard for us to figure out how much is the mental illness and how much are side effects of different medications. Um, that said, one of the promising things is that we know that people with intellectual disabilities, with cognitive deficits, can take advantage of many of the standard cognitive behavioral therapies that have proven to be helpful in schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, um, and so forth. And at our center, one of the things that we're doing is um, experimenting in that way, offering, for example, mindfulness-based stress reduction to individuals that have intellectual disabilities, and we've had an enormously positive response. So again, we don't, don't often think of the two going together. And also, one more thing is that many clinicians, when they encounter these folks in their practice, they simply say, oh, well, they're hearing voices or they seem a little sad. That's just because they have an intellectual disability. So they attribute those symptoms to the intellectual disability without really doing that full evaluation of yes. looking at um, mental Ill possible mental illness. So this siloing, of course, uh, is problematic for the Huge. kids you see, but it's also problematic for, for treating uh, uh, dual diagnosis substance use problems. Yes. So, so we've been talking uh, about research that leads perhaps to pharmacologic therapeutics, uh, although mindfulness is a, with psychotherapies. Are, no, no, exactly. <laughs> probably better than some other things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but research also leads to uh, changes in policy. So maybe well, I, you want to, yeah. I'd also like to address uh, siloing, which yeah, is, yeah. is what we're all yeah, talking. Yeah. Siloing and overlaps yeah. and collaboration, and how important that is for so many groups and individuals. Um, so you know, we already covered Dickens. Um, but as Tolstoy <laughs> said, uh, all happy families are the same and every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Um, <laughs> so it's to say that uh, you know there you know there things have been distinguished for a long time substance use disorders, intellectual disabilities, different mental illnesses, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder um, that we're you know we're discovering through I think both you know understanding people's lived experience and also also through basic science there's these distinctions are not necessarily real. Um, I think analogously, um, you know, different stakeholders and different types of researchers and politicians need to be able to work together. And I think in almost every one of those groups, we do this terribly. I mean, look what happened last week. Um, so, you know, I think it's important for a new generation of investigators to understand that, you know, while someone may primarily be focused on being, you know, a genetics researcher, they have to be able to work with translational researchers or you know, understand the policy implications of their research. Mm -hmm. And I guess from my perspective, um, both being a graduate student currently and running an organization that um, is primarily interested in engaging young scientists um, in becoming successful investigators and clinicians um, with lived experience that um, you know, I, I see those bridgings happening more than I do in the previous generation. Um, you know, Glad that everyone's still around, but I see exciting things happening. And you know, to address the funding issue, oh, is, is much of the same problem. Um, and I think you know, you can't. I've seen this several times in place, you know, organizations that I've worked with. That you know, you become very reliant on you know one cash cow, whether it's NIH or SAMHSA or pharma, um, and that's no longer a possibility in any of these ways. You know, as you said, industries pulling out. You know, the federal uh, budget is being cut. You know, there's a role for private foundation funding. But it's never, you know, I think it's a really poor strategy as a young investigator or for any investigators um, to, to rely on one funding source. And I think, you know, it both can provide more sustainability for your line of research to bring together multiple streams of funding. And at the same time, you know, that gives control of the research and you know, the advocacy and the dissemination and the policy change to the people who should be in control of it, which are the people that have the knowledge, not the people that have the power through money. Good. So mm -hmm. let me change the subject. Can I follow okay, up? Okay, can I follow up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Lisa, I think that's a really great point. I spent um, the previous year in a different job, which yeah. was uh, a new institute that we started at NIH called the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. And 
And uh, while there was some trafficking with the uh, mental health field, 90% of what we did was in the cancer yeah. community, rare disease community, lots of other communities. And what was so striking, because a lot of the work was with the uh, advocacy community, was in those other areas when you dealt with the multiple myeloma or the type 1 diabetes or the lymphoma advocates, uh, areas, by the way, where we know much more than yeah. we know about yeah. any of mm -hmm. these disorders, mm -hmm. um, the advocates, the families, were pushing for better science, not yeah. just better services. And there's a funny disconnect when you come back to this world, the world of whether it's substance abuse or schizophrenia or autism or intellectual disabilities, that so much of the focus is on let's get better access, let's reduce stigma, let's make sure we get better services. But nobody does what the vice president did last night and s stands up to say, we just don't know enough. So we are saying that about cancer. Mm -hmm. And we are saying that about type 1 diabetes, and we are saying that about multiple myeloma, but not as much here, uh, and particularly on the advocacy side. And I, it's a mm -hmm. question I think we all have to ask ourselves, whether we're um, getting ahead of ourselves by assuming that if we just improve access, we'll improve outcomes. We'd like to think that, but, but I, I, that's not yeah. entirely clear. Do you want to have a yeah, rejoinder? Yeah, well, I would just like to say that, yeah. I mean, Dr. Insel just presented another dichotomy, which is science or service. Mm -hmm. I mean, service services should ultimately be informed right. by science yeah, right. that's exactly. not yeah. only you know yeah. how do the services work and do they work but the you know the policy science between how do people get those services how do we give them access to voluntary services that are culturally acceptable however we're defining culture that also work within their particular context the context of their person and their brain and their person you know in their community right so, so just okay. to clarify I mean I think the the, the problem is that these are still so uh, siloed in a sense. And yeah. the, the conversation that often happens in rooms like this is why does it take 15 or 17 years to move from research to practice? Right. And really the question we should be asking is why aren't we moving all practice into research, yes. right? Yeah. Why aren't we putting a scientific payload into yep. every service delivery system yep. so that we learn from what we're doing Absolutely. and collect the information in a way that helps us to actually well do it said. better? Well so said. Elizabeth and, and Nora both have. Yep, yeah. One of the, um, just to piggyback on what's already been said, one of the things that we see in the intellectual disability community is that the advocate groups and who are very powerful um, are stepping in to fund science, and that's a great yeah. thing. In Down syndrome, uh, Williams syndrome, prader willi syndrome, Rett syndrome, all of these uh, conditions associated with intellectual disabilities are very strong advocates and are pulling some of our young scientists um, into the fold by funding their research. However, my fear in that is that they become mini silos, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. so there isn't a lot of crosstalk between the prader willi syndrome um, uh, advocacy organizations and the Angelman syndrome um, advocacy <laughs> organizations, even right. though they share a the genetic um, the UBE3A uh, yes. <laughs> and so, community. You know, yeah. we, we it's great yeah. to turn to the to the those organizations yeah. for support and funding and ideas, um, and the population as well. But I see a further siloing right. within that community that I think doesn't serve us well. Good point. Good. And I think no. that another very different uh, situation with respect to diabetes and mental illness mm -hmm. is the notion that when you're very, very hungry, the only <coughs> thing that you can think is about to eat. And the reality is, for example, in substance use disorder, 10% um, of people receive treatment. So I think that what mm -hmm. happens is that the relatives are, are desperate to get some level of treatment and it's an urgency. I think that as we cover the needs of the mentally ill to receive treatment and evidence-based treatment, I think that the field will become spontaneously much more open at the value of science. And at the same time, I do believe that that message, because I hear it all the time with substance abuse treatments, oh, we have buprenorphine and, and we have methadone. You should be content with that. I said, no, I'm not content with that. <laughs> The relapse rate is extremely high. Why should we be content with suboptimal treatments? Yeah. And that is a message that we have to do. But, but we also have to be very aware that until very recently, and still now, a lot of people with mental illness are not getting the, the treatment for which there is evidence that would improve. And that, that's a reality that we have in practice. But I think there is this you know, very basic human fear of kind of, I think is related to stigma of kind of 
things spiraling so out of control that there's you know, only a void to fall into if you don't get some treatment, whatever it is, even if it, it doesn't work, it doesn't matter if it doesn't work, at least we did something, we tried something. You know, I think particularly for family members and even clinicians who may be at a loss with certain individuals as to what to do. Um, so you know, as long, it's, it doesn't work. I mean, why are we putting money into these things? You know, more research funding, you know, more funding for policy and services, insurance coverage for things that don't work just because people are scared. We should be finding real answers. Of course, that's not only true in, in mental health. I mean, uh, the, um, the, the, the notion that, uh, that practice should be, insofar as we have knowledge and research, it should be research-based is violated all the time when people have a cancer that they're going to die of and they want a certain treatment. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a big problem for us, but it's not uniquely ours. But it helps. Yeah. Uh, I think it does yeah. remind us that one of the roles of science is not just to come up with right. the new thing, right. but to also clarify whether what we're How currently we doing is worth exactly. doing or not. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and if you look at some of the more important discoveries that have been made through NIMH, I think for better or for worse, including during your time, Steve, some of those are the ones that say, hey, this is not as good yeah. as everybody thought it was. Mm -hmm. Well, right, the big antipsychotics trial, right? Tells very, you what not to do. Very disappointing, but right. very important to know. Well, but yeah. also let me, we only have 15 minutes before, um, or even 10 before we're going to open it up, and it's fine to open it up, but I do want to ask something very different, maybe a little radioactive, and in, <laughs> in fact, I see uh, the incoming president of the American Psychiatric Association sitting there uh, in the corner um, uh, looking at me, but the issue of diagnosis, <laughs> right? So the, um, you know, we, we do need, you know, as we do clinical research or policy level research, uh, um, uh, we, you know, we have, even though we know it's early in science, we, we have to give things names. We have to be able to uh, agree that, you know, we mean this person or that person, and yet, you know, the, uh, uh, the DSM-5 uh, was, uh, although I understand it's selling very well, uh, congratulations, <laughs> was met with I a certain <laughs> uh, negativity uh, in the press. And Dr. Insel to my left famously uh, released a blog saying, you know, uh, scientists, you have nothing to lose but your chains, uh, strike them off, and, you know. Um, uh, and it's, it, you know, I'm making it a little bit funny, but, the, the, but, but it is actually, there raises a question. When we do our research, are we confident that we know the population we're studying? Are we studying the right population? And, and the response of the public to a lot of the negative press could be one of, I think, excessive and inappropriate distrust. So um, may, maybe, uh, I don't know if any of you want to reflect on where you think diagnosis is, not, not, not to I always say about the DSM, easy to make fun of, hard to do better, uh, given what we've known. Uh, but where are we going? Um, you know, uh, I mean, autism, there was a lot of controversy around mm -hmm. uh, b um, turning autism into a spectrum, which I think was scientifically right. Mm -hmm. But how, how, how do these things affect, you know, the clinical side of things from your point of view? Well, I think it's huge. And, um, you know, part of the stance of the scientists in our center is to um, kind of wait and see and do a little bit of both. So on the one hand, you know, they're, they're using the DSM-5 as they need to for billing purposes and other reasons, but when it comes to um, their studies and their research, they're really doing fine-tuned characterizations of the phenotype, and that's true in my research program as well, so that we can look at these broader categories and say, you know what, this person seems to have any typical psychosis, um, but let's, deep, let's go down deeper. Let's look at some you know, altered hormones, perhaps. Let's do some really detailed cognitive and behavioral testing and questionnaires so that we can dig much deeper into the phenotype. And I think that's where um, a lot of the excitement is. I'm thrilled about the new RDOCs, and I think those um, really uh, open up the world of research in the area of developmental disabilities. Nora, you? Yeah, no, I, I think it, there are two elements to the DSM-5, and again, I come as a speaker for the substance use disorders, and it's the notion of being able to characterize um, substance use disorder as a disease opens up the, the possibility of getting treatment, and in and of itself, that's again, I'm not giving it as a given. 
because until right now, many of the individuals that have substance use disorders are not, uh, they, they have no way of getting their treatment covered. So that's an aspect that's extraordinarily important. What is evolving, like it has evolved in other neurological diseases, I was thinking as you were speaking about epilepsy, when I was a medical student, they would say grand mal seizures, complex seizures, local seizures. And now we have a much better on understanding of the heterogeneity of the disorder and the, the interventions are also very distinct. So I think that as knowledge advances, it's becoming clear that these are heterogeneous diseases. And we've known it all along that they are heterogeneous diseases because the outcomes were very different. Mm -hmm. But yet, in a way, we needed some common language that will allow mm -hmm. us to translate mm -hmm. a certain procedures. And I think that that's where the diagnostic tools rely. But at the same time, that in no way should interfere with the research to help us understand and dissect those syndromes. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what will come about, because it's actually, and you mentioned that too, is that comorbidities are reality. And to me, the notion that comorbidity is so frequent is yep. telling us something very explicit about the mental illness itself. Mm -hmm. So we have these networks. A given network does not belong to schizophrenia or to drug addiction. The extent to which those networks get disrupted is going to result in certain symptoms. Exactly. And in certain instances, it's going to appear as comorbidity. So, I, so, so mm -hmm. I view the value of DSM into something that we need in order to take care of patients. But I also clearly, as we are dealing with mental illness, we're just taking the tip of what's behind them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to comment as uh, someone who is, researches um, self-help modalities. So, uh, you know, in the U.S., um, self-help groups, you know, there's Hearing Voices Network groups have come here, and DBSA has been around for a while, and DBSA obviously encompasses depression and bipolar disorder. Um, in the UK, there seems to be more of a focus, I've been kind of investigating lately, on problem-specific groups. So hearing voices, unusual beliefs, paranoia, suicide, um, and I mean, more research needed, uh, so you should always conclude. You know, and whether that, as an approach, um, you know, that could be generalized is more effective to focus on specific problems. You know, paranoia is something that you could experience if you're labeled with schizophrenia or if you're labeled with BPD bipolar. or with you know bipolar disorder, and it's the problem itself that you know is focused on rather than this large categorical disorder. Um, but I guess I don't have an answer. I'm kind of posing a question. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me ask Tom. Where 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 do you see diagnosis going, I and mean, what would you uh, what would you like to see maybe ten years from now? Well, I you know I don't think there's anything unique about yeah. um, developmental disorders or mental illnesses. It's, this is the same discussion that's being had throughout medicine. And the challenge is to get beyond symptoms. Yeah. Um, there are very few areas of medicine that remain that where the diagnosis is only based on symptoms. We think about that with a little more fervor in the realm of brain disorders because one of the w things we've learned is that the way the brain is constructed, the way it's wired, uh, it preserves behavior above all else. Okay. So if you have Parkinson's disease, you don't develop the tremor, the rigidity, the slowness until you've lost 80% of your dopamine cells. That's a lot. It takes about a decade for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that we only define Parkinson's disease as having those symptoms, you've lost 10 years in which you might have intervened to be able to preempt all of that from happening. Now we don't know what that time frame is for schizophrenia, or for autism, or for bipolar disorder, any of these illnesses, but it's likely to be extensive. And if we continue to say schizophrenia is the onset of psychosis, it's like saying we're only going to think about someone's heart disease after they've had a heart attack. And we know what that meant in the course of 30 years of losing lots of people to ischemic heart disease. Now we prevent it rather than having to worry about mm -hmm. how to treat somebody after they've lost 30 or 40 percent of their cardiac function. That's great. That's great. Um, we're going to turn to the audience in just about three or four minutes. I'm just wondering whether any of you uh, wanted to ask each other a question or raise any point that I haven't in this extraordinarily rich, rich world. Yeah, no, and I, I like to raise that question to, to Tom because as we think about the notion of
can we identify the early evidence of disruption that can ultimately result in, in illness? Um, we are addressing, the, I mean, Ill illnesses can go in different ways, and as you are dealing with cardiovascular disease, you actually are promoting a healthy lifestyle and certain interventions. So how do you view that transition, uh, Tom? I mean, so if you, if you have an, an early evidence that someone is disconnected, that is not properly interacting, mm -hmm. how, how do you address it? How do you, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, it's a great question, and there's a number of uh, ethical, social issues that we'd want to think about because um, the question that usually comes up is if you've got a 15-year-old basement kid, somebody who's spending uh, 40 hours a week in the basement playing video games, um, he's probably like 80% of the other 15-year-olds in his class. <laughs> and um, some of those adolescents will go on to become psychotic in three years. Most of them will not. So you don't want to say, uh, hey, everybody needs to be on Thorazine. That's not the <laughs> answer here, right? The question is, are there, um, are there tools that could be developed when either the 15-year-old himself or his parents or his people in school are concerned that will be helpful? And what would those look like? Um, yeah. Could it be that the video games themselves become tools with which you help people develop executive functions yeah. and create resilience? Mm -hmm. Could it be that there are social networks that would be useful? Mm -hmm. This is where I think Laisha can really change the world. I think mm -hmm. by helping people to take a role in this themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, medicine is really changing in a profound way across, across the whole spectrum. And the whole idea that you come in as a patient to some professional who has all the answers yeah and they see you and they fix whatever it is you have, that's really not gonna survive. It probably never did. Yeah. Didn't even well. It's not actually real. So. Right, didn't, didn't even work for our cars. But yeah. um, <laughs> let me, uh, yeah. So that, you yeah. know, I think we're at a point yeah. now where the yeah. question is how do you yeah. empower families, individuals, mm -hmm. teachers, everyone to become involved in making the world uh, a little better yeah. so that, and the other point I'd make about this, Nora, which I thought was amazing last night, when uh, Tim Beck got up and uh, yeah. didn't get up, yeah. he sat uh, at n age 94, 95, 94, yeah. uh, and talked right. about right. how we have to get past thinking about the problem as just the presenting symptoms yes. and begin to recognize. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people, we think actually as many as 24% of the general population who have hallucinations of some form. Mm -hmm. That doesn't keep them from working right. And, right. and marrying and raising kids yeah. and having a life. Uh, so it's got to be more than just thinking about hallucinations, delusions, ideas of reference, all that. There's got to be a way of embracing so a far more sophisticated so a, a quick comment because then I want to okay, open it up. Okay, quick comment. Yeah. I think that we have to shift in medicine and psychology to a disease model where you deal with the symptom when it arises to promoting mental health and well-being. Yeah. And you know, for many reasons, you know, the National Institutes of Mental Health may have, it's really more about mental illness in some ways than it is about mental health. And there is a new branch of the field I'm in of psychology called positive psychology, which is really thinking about ways that we all can use to promote well-being and mental well-being and mental health that is based on the strengths that we have on mindfulness practice and other such things, so. Great. Yeah. So now I'm gonna turn to uh, you. We have two people already at the microphone, and let me just remind everyone, because we have limited time, please uh, try not to give a speech, but to ask a question <laughs> that ends, you know, with a, your voice being upwardly inflected. If you <laughs> wanna direct it to one of the particular speakers, do so, but if not, I can uh, do that for you. Th thank you very much, thank, thank you for the panel. Uh, my name is Patrick Donahue with the Sarah Jane Brain Foundation. Uh, what was interesting is that I didn't hear any discussion about the leading cause of death and disability for kids, young adults, which is brain injury and the comorbidity with mental health. So if you look at the incidence rates of brain injury in youth in America, it's over 765,000 yeah. American youth enter an ED each year with a new brain injury. 38 to 63% of people coming in for substance abuse um, have a history of brain injury. We look at the budgets of whether it's NIMH or Drug Abuse or National Institute, um, 
very few of those dollars are put towards any types of brain injury related research, especially on the comorbidity. My question is, how do we put a crowbar to your wallets and put a demolition <laughs> to the silos? Because it's, it's really a disaster that's going on with the lack of research mm -hmm. in this area. So uh, maybe I'll take a quick run on that uh, very quickly. So on the latter part, I don't think that it's as siloed as many people might think. Actually, this happens to be one area, uh, these TBI and PTS or PTSD, uh, where um, there are lots of efforts across mm -hmm. DOD, VA, NIH, and, and even more broadly, especially in that case, Department of Education for mm -hmm. Brain Injury, mm -hmm. um, to create a new agenda. We've just released a shared research action plan that involves uh, real dollars, $100 million that DOD and VA just put in together, uh, lots of efforts there. Having said that, um, this is a very difficult area, partly because one, it's quite common, and we, it's been very difficult to actually study brain injury with the kind of detail and uh, precision that we have for studying injury to lots of other organs. I have to say that last night, uh, hearing um, Vice President Biden uh, talk about this, um, about the need to do the brain initiative, partly so that we could have the both diagnostics and therapeutics that we need for all these other brain-related problems, was uh, really inspiring. Um, the White House held a meeting on the Brain Initiative on March, uh, on April 2nd, another one on mental health on June 3rd, and there was no crosstalk between those two <laughs> until last night. And so having someone bridge those and say, by the way, if you really want to change the world for people with mental illness, we've got this brain initiative that could help us to get there, including for those who've had brain injury. Uh, that was, I think, very reassuring to see that someone's drawing the line between them. Yes. Um, I have two two points to raise. One is about stigma and one is about translating what the brilliance of the research is showing us into the community and into treatment so that it could decrease stigma. Um, Tom, at the last meeting, you told me that 87% of treatment is done by social workers and by PsyDs, and I've been investigating that. And I spoke with Myrna Weissman, and there is no criteria for what a social worker or a PsyD knows in neurobiology. And that's an outrage. I recently started a, a support group for people with borderline. So, so try to make it a question. Not the a, question yeah. is, why yeah. are there any standards of care, of education? Why aren't we required to make people know what we already know so we can improve treatment? When I run a group with borderline personality disorder and I show the neurobiology cutting edge slides that the researchers give me, and a patient says, you mean I'm not a bad person and my parents aren't bad, it breaks my heart. Secondly, if you keep doing stigma against families, nobody's coming out to advocate. You gotta cut the stigma down because otherwise people aren't gonna help. Okay, question, so, uh, Alicia. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope that I'm, this is not coming across as reinforcing what I was just talking about breaking down in terms of silos. You know, there, there are obviously many things that contribute to suffering and distress that we may or may not call mental illness, including borderline personality disorder, and some of that is environmental, and uh, you know, your childhood and your family and adverse childhood experiences and whatever stresses you're experiencing now, and some of that, it, kind of less defined at this point is in the brain and is genetic or epigenetic and changes over the life course. So I think that you know, MSW counselors not being, you know, understanding sophisticated brain dynamics is not necessarily a failing because they are highly trained in addressing the social dynamics and interpersonal dynamics that people have experienced and are experiencing. Um, let, let me let Nora answer because I want to. We have a line forming, so unless you have. Yeah, yeah no, no. I don't want to cut you off though. If you have some really key. Well, I guess the other thing yeah. I wanted to say is that <laughs> at this point, um, you know, bio, biomedical explanations of mental disorders increase stigma. They make people not want to marry people labeled with mental disorders, not hire them, not live next to them, not be friends with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can. You know, both of these things are important. Stigma reduction. Know, understanding the you know basic science be behind mental disorders at the same time they're they're you know in opposition in some ways at this point so that we're kind of in a bind in a way. 
Nora. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, obviously I resonate with your point that it is crucial that we break the stigma. And I think that uh, um, events like this one can help uh, change it, but it's a complex oh, issue. And the stigma leads not only to the family to be afraid to speak up, but it also leads to the person that's being stigmatized to actually go out and seek for help. And it's also stigmatized vis-a-vis -vis the science of what you are doing. So the stigma is not, not helping absolutely anyone. And I actually, I think it's obviously making the problem much more complex. And it's in mental illness, it's in drug addiction. The other uh, item and the other dialogue that we have, as we, and, and this resonated with what you were saying, is we have suffering not just from mental illness. And, and immediately what jumped into my brain is the concept of chronic pain. We don't think of chronic pain as a mental illness, and yet a significant portions of individuals with mental, with chronic pain have suicidal ideation, at least 30% of them. And yet, yet we don't consider it part of mental illness. And yet in a way, it's part of what we do. So let me uh, uh, turn to the next questioner, Jeff Lieberman. To the human brain mapping initiative, we're describing um, that advances in research in some ways depend on technology uh, as well as sort of conceptual discovery of new knowledge. Um, the other thing that I think is low hanging fruit that we really don't take uh, enough or place enough emphasis on is the fact that simply applying existing knowledge and moving it from the research area into practice more efficiently would have an impact. Um, we've learned, like you mentioned, from the Katie study as well as other studies, uh, clinical practice is difficult to change. Plus the reimbursement structure of um, the government and uh, insurance companies doesn't provide the leverage to redirect practice in ways that research would uh, uh, encourage. The NIH used to have consensus conferences where they would bring people together to determine when something was ready for prime time. Um, this is a multifaceted problem, but I'd like to ask particularly Tom and Nora, um, is there a way that we could affect a mechanism that could move things more quickly into practice and to introduce it? I mean, this is a problem throughout medicine, but uh, probably maybe most of all in mental health care. We don't have the consensus, con we Anymore. haven't run them uh, for yeah. about five years, four or five years. Um, there are ways, I mean, that's one of the values of having an NIH is you can convene mm -hmm. meetings and create um, policies, uh, provide clear guidance. We don't do clinical guidelines, uh, although the Heart Institute has done that. We've stayed away from that. It's one of the places where often working with uh, professional societies can be very helpful. Uh, yeah, and the way that I view it, I mean, as a director of NIDA on an institute that is highly stigmatized the drug abuse field, is so one of the most stigmatized field, is what is it, uh, the knowledge that we can generate that forces those making policy decisions to actually change, that it's so clear crystal that you can no longer ignore it. So, so that is, I think, the strategy that we've, we've used in the substance abuse field. And, and it has, it, has, it, it has started to slowly work. And I think that now with obviously as we're getting into healthcare reform that we're going to provide insurance to a lot of the mentally ill and substance abuse individuals, that in turn is going to generate a competition of services which will promote, one would hope, excellence. So, and where the evidence base is going to be much more required than the current status. Let's so let me, let, let me, we have three more questioners and not that much time, but I, I just would want to add one other point, which is a general point about busy practitioners mm -hmm. and the cognitive distortions we all have as human beings. So you do things and you think they work because in your own practice you're not, you want to think what you're doing is good and you don't randomize uh, your patients or blind yourself. So an NIH consensus conference that was held when I was at NIH in the 1990s was on um, the fact that uh, peptic ulcers are actually caused by a bacterium, Helicobacter, and are best treated with an antibiotic uh, and something to lower stomach acid. And the reason for the consensus conference was really rhetorical. The, th these facts had been known for more than a decade, and physicians in the United States were still prescribing tranquilizers and milk 
uh, uh, which, you know, were giving patients only side effects and no benefit. But, of course, since most peptic ulcers resolve on their own, the doctors knew for sure that they were curing them. So I think, I think part of this issue of really influencing practice uh, really requires that we, 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 we think about how healthcare practitioners learn, incorporate information, why they're – it's said to be so conservative. You know, I mean, so, th so there are these research issues or policy issues, but I don't think enough attention has been paid to uh, the behavioral infirmities of practicing medicine. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Oh, you, oh, you, oh, you want to say? You yeah. wanna, I was going to say that in the field of intellectual disabilities, <laughs> our goal is to have those practitioners open their doors to the clients that we serve, to kids with, and, or adults with Down syndrome or prader willi syndrome. So our, we would just want to get a foot in the door um, because oftentimes they're refused treatment. And so we've also developed, and many f other folks have as well, practice guidelines and tip sheets um, and, you know, anyway. Yes, you have to inject them. You have yes. to inject yes. them, yes. yes. Next question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. I would like to um, bring a little bit emphasis on uh, the Surgeon General's report of 1999. When it came out, I was very anxious to read it. But then he also added special report on cultural diversity. Yes. And I want to know that when you – I just want to comment that when, as a clinician, I see – that the problem of mental illness and substance abuse is a big, big issue for communities of color. And in that aspect, is there a way that your research team, do you have enough qualified, you know, um, ethnic, uh, qualified researchers who are of ethnic diversities who, and is there something that can be really come out of to see, to see what are some of the specific things that can be seen as far as metabolism of uh, antipsychotics or certain things specific to different populations which will help us when we do assessments. You know, I'm usually in the ER doing assessment with cr um, clinicians to clients um, in crisis and you need to put a lot of things into perspective so apart from looking at the acute symptoms. So I was yeah. gonna, you're, what you're raising warrants a whole conference, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do an injustice to it by answering it very briefly. I'm going to answer it very yeah. briefly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, so the, the, the NIH does give um, diversity grants to um, the graduate students, PhD students, and medical students um, to train them in research, and it includes uh, people of certain racial and ethnic minorities, people with disabilities, and people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, I've seen very few successful, um, right. but the it's, pipeline is the pipeline. Yes, is there, there is a mechanism yeah. there. How successful it is yeah. at actually getting the right people into research is a problem. I would also like to say, as an activist, that this is an enormous problem in the mental health advocacy community that there's not sufficient representation of people of color. In the intellectual disability field, there's a little bit of a ray of hope. The National Network of Centers of Excellence on Disabilities are asked to teach their trainees about cultural competence, and as is the Leadership Education and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Training Programs, where students that are OTPT in the allied health fields um, take units on cultural competence and have to demonstrate that. But I think, uh, again, this, this is a very important question that would deserve uh, yep. much, much more time, and I'm just sorry we don't, we don't have it. Next question. Oh, thank you. Uh, Kevin McNaught with the uh, Torres Syndrome Association. So Tom and, and, and uh, Stephen both noted the, the great exodus of the pharmaceutical industry yeah. from developing um, medication for mental illnesses. Now certainly they will renew their interest and they will come back with advances in, in uh, understanding of how the brain works. But can we afford to wait for that? Is, is, I mean, certainly there needs to be something here yeah. and now yeah. that will in addition to, to stopping the drain, will also bring them back to the field. So is, is there anything yeah. that's, that's being done to do that? I'm sorry I'm, I'm in, in, in a hurry because I want to make sure also the last question behind you. So I'm going to ask Tom maybe to talk about NCATS, what, what well, you've learned about translation. Yeah. But let me just say there's one other thing which, which could, could be a policy issue. Um, the pricing in cancer now is irresistible, oh. right? Um, doctors are now starting to revolt, but, uh, you know, to caricature it in a way that's a little bit unfair, you know, $100,000 for an extra 20 minutes of life, um, and 
frankly, when, uh, when the pricing in one area is so disproportionate, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, w the way I put it is this. I get very angry, as a scientist and a mental health professional, I get very angry at where things are going. But then I hope that my 401k owns shares in these companies <laughs> I'm angry at because what they're doing is they're just following the money. So I think there really is an interesting and much more complicated than we think about it ecosystem uh, that, uh, that will be, needs to be addressed along with the science to, 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 to move us as quickly as we need to move toward translation. So just real quickly, Kevin, I, th you know, I think it's a good question. There is, it, some of it is the ecosystem. Some of it, frankly, is the companies science. left because the science isn't yeah. good enough. And they're looking for targets. They have targets for cancer. They have targets in lots of metabolic diseases. They look at schizophrenia and they say, okay, D2 receptor, what else you got? And we're, uh, you know, your area is actually a good one because it could be that in Tourette or in places like that, mm -hmm. some of the more well-defined disorders, we may get to a target faster. This is where the genomics will be helpful, the imaging will be helpful, and also we have to get away from, and I think our role can help here, from thinking that the next therapeutic has to be a small molecule. Mm -hmm. right. uh, we may want to be thinking about how do you bring a whole package of things yeah. together. Yeah. They call yeah. these network yeah. solutions now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And bringing devices and psychosocial treatments and psychoeducation and all of that together as a package, um, that could be the place which will get these companies back involved. It hasn't yet, but it could. Great. We made it. Last question. And uh, I promise to be very yeah. quick. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, but... No, um, yeah. my name is Paul Williams. I work for Healthcare for All that's actually based here in um, uh, Boston, consumer-based advocacy group. But we do a lot of policy, and it's actually, I'm glad I was the last one to do this because the question, I've been a huge fan of Nora's work. Um, my background is in addiction. You mentioned buprenorphine and methadone, and you have something like the DOD who just had TRICARE lift the prohibition on it. Where, and so if that's just happening weeks ago, where are the areas on policy for everyone here in mental health or behavioral health that we can start weighing in now so that we're not having that issue where it's just catching up later on? Where, where is the research, where's the cutting edge stuff that we should be looking at from policy? Well, that, well, that also deserves an hour. And of course, the organizers are opening the doors. They're, they're threatening to pull the fire alarm. So very fast. Uh, oh, yeah. I think yeah. each of us could give several. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, you, you are posing the question in the way that we should all be poising us, it to, to ourselves. So when there's something that is ready to be implemented, we shall have to be very proactive in educating those that can then go forward and, mm -hmm. and, and make ch changes in policy. But as was mentioned before, the whole transition from a scientific evidence into a policy is not automatic. And, and so it does require that integration, and that's why, I mean, meetings like this one are so wonderful, because you have the scientists, and then you have the people that can inform that change in policy. And the, uh, of course, the, those that are providing the treatment, and now the insurance companies. I mean, yeah, Nora, said, Nora said, you know, science to policy, and then there's, you know, policy, policy to, to implementation, science. and then there's implementation to fidelity and, you know, yeah. and dissemination, so. Yeah, so I'd, like I'd, I'd be very concrete here. I think one of the things you see is when you look at CMS, they support for people with uh, chronic mental illness or serious mental illness. They, they, you have to have the disease as a chronic disease before you get supported for something like supported employment, supported education, a whole range of psychosocial interventions that we know really work. They really save lives. They really have an impact, sometimes bigger than the medications which CMS does support. We need to move that way, way earlier in the course so that there is reimbursement for those kinds of services and for family-based services at the beginning and not waiting until someone has been ill for 10 years before you say, okay, now you have a chronic illness and you can get it. You that also have to, to live change. in the right state. Yeah. I mean, you, can't, right. you have to have a chronic illness and live in the exact right place in the country. But you can have the federal, the federal government can set a in this case, the CMS can set a set of standards of what they'd expect. Okay, thank you to this Thanks. wonderful group of panelists. Thank you thank to the you. audience. Thank and, you. And uh, I wish we, wish we had more time. I but do too. It's all good. <laughs> okay.